Chapter 21, 9 a.m. UTC minus 6, 4 p.m. UTC plus 1. The last time I got back to the hospital, I'd just day-skipped away from a gun to the head and felt slightly frustrated. After this last day-skip, when no longer facing a gun in Paris, but a question, I felt relieved. I am a fool sometimes. I grabbed my phone to check time and date. 9.01 a.m., Saturday, January 3rd. What to do? I called Mom and Dad. Looks like I will be released today, I related. Does it still work for you to come pick me up? After the phone call, I checked social media, then played a game. A bird flapped up and down on the phone display, avoiding, or colliding with, obstacles which streamed in from the right. I thought about Amadi Koulibaly. How will I respond to his question? A nurse entered. The doctor wants me to observe you walking, just to make sure there's no balance issues or nausea, she informed me. I went with her through the hallways, twice stopping to lift something at her direction. When she was satisfied, the nurse allowed me to return to my room. While I was out, another hospital bed had been brought in to the elderly man's spot. I wondered about how he was doing. I angled my knees upward on the bed and dropped my head back on the pillow. I woke to find myself in the familiar surroundings of my apartment's bedroom. My alarm clock reported the time, 9.04 a.m. I checked my phone to make sure of the date, Sunday, January 4th. I guess I should take in the church service, I concluded. Besides, I know I did, slash, will. Today's church bulletin was, slash, will be stuck in my Bible's front pocket later on today. I got ready and left. While I shivered inside my car, waiting for the engine to warm a little, I realized how tired I was getting of the day skipping. The car clock showed 9.59 through the fogged up display. The temperature change from one side of the day skip to the other registered sharply as I went from a cold car to the warm concourse of the Regina airport. I sat on a bench. Mum's inquiring text occupied the display of my phone. I made a decision. Honesty is the best policy. So I texted in reply, Hi Mum, I'm really feeling fine, back to normal. But I am going away for a few days, someplace interesting, Paris. I have the week off work, so I might as well do something. I'll text you when I can. Don't worry about me. I wondered if that would do it. As I waited, I overheard a nearby woman mention Euros and ATM. Those words set me thinking. I know I have Euros when I'm in Paris, but I've never thought about how I got them. I watched the couple go to an area where several ATMs waited for customers. I went to an available unit and discovered the ATM would connect with my bank and provide European currency for a steep fee. Okay, might as well. Strangely, during the whole Euro business, my mind drifted to a stranger. Not Koulibaly, but Nanon. Wondered. I wandered over to the gate for my flight. At 9.39, my phone buzzed. Mom. Paris? Wow, surprising. Why not Hawaii this time of year? But okay, I guess the holiday will do you good. Don't hesitate to get medical help if you need it. I smiled. Ten minutes later, the call went out to start boarding for Air Canada Flight 1114. I got into line and was waiting when I seemed to be moving through water up to my waist, with something horrifying stuck on my right hand. The hand twitched and jerked as I tried to get it off. Then, on a park bench, my excited brain sent one last electrical signal to my hand, which spasmed into another powerful twitch. My phone went flying out of my grasp. Suddenly there came a flapping sound mixed with a kind of squeak and a whirl of grey, and I lurched backward against the lean of the bench. My first thought was of Koulibaly and death. Then I realized the grey blur was a pigeon. And I laughed, loud and heartily, not caring who heard me. Despite all the complexity, the strangeness, the weariness, the danger, the frustration, the boredom, I laughed. Let's see, I said out loud, still amused. That all started on Monday in Regina at the airport, in line for the flight. Day skipped to Tuesday, dreaming about something in the Hotel International, then got here in a day skip with my hand still acting out my dream. I became quiet for a minute or two, letting my eyes roam around Place de Vosges. With sudden clarity, I accessed the outgoing calls list in my phone and deleted the call Manon had made to herself. There, now I have no way of contacting her. I'm not going down that road. 
the pigeon returned to peck near my feet. I shivered. Got to move on. Where to from here? I checked a map. There's a museum a few blocks from here. Why not? Before starting out, I remembered the electronic promise to Mum made in the Regina airport two hours slash two days ago. I quickly thumbed. Hi Mum, you might have heard about the terrorist attack in Paris today, but I'm fine. In fact, it's very peaceful here. I feel perfectly safe right now. I guess that's good enough. Sand. I started walking briskly westward. Soon I came to La Musée Carnavalet, dedicated to the history of Paris. It was open for business, and I entered. I stood by a painting of the storming of the Bastille when I went back to a bench, this time in front of the police prefecture. A few people passed on the sidewalk. Thursday. I have been put out by the police. My plan is to show them, if they are watching, to show them where my loyalties lie. I consulted my phone for the route and started. I stepped quickly, partly to get warm, and partly to see if anyone hurried to keep up. I went southwest on Boulevard du Palais. At the next corner, by a bridge over an arm of the Seine, I turned left onto Quai de Marché Neuf, followed that street past a four-story building. Dusk gathered in the January sky. I turned to glance behind. Two men, one on the same sidewalk and another on the opposite side of the street, seemed to abruptly look away. Bingo! Gotcha! I celebrated inwardly. Now you'll see what I do. As I came to the next intersection, a magnificent sight opened across a plaza, the towering western face of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. I went forward through the plaza toward the front entrance of the Gothic church. So much history happened here, I noted as I scanned an article about the building on my phone's web browser. Napoleon was crowned emperor here. Kings and all kinds of notable people were married and buried here. A second glance behind me showed the two men still following. I came to the entrance, feeling small. The western side held a feature called the Tympanum of the Last Judgment, a carving of Christ seated on a throne surrounded by large numbers of people. Eternal destiny depended upon him. The carving seemed significant as I considered facing Kulabali again. I joined a line of people waiting to enter the building and texted Mom, in line to see Notre Dame Cathedral. A nun in traditional garb stepped behind me, and when I looked her way she greeted me, in English to my surprise. Do you work here? I asked after a moment, wondering if that seemed like a completely ignorant thing to say. The nun's laugh formed creases on her no longer young face. No, my, uh, order is not based here. But you might say I have come to help sojourners on their way. She peered at me over the top of her glasses. And what have you, young man? Are you focused on what you are being called to in this time? What an odd question, but strangely appropriate. You know, I replied, I would have to say yes, but it... It's not an easy thing I need to do. Few worthwhile things in life are easy, reflected the nun. That does not mean we should give up on them. Words followed. I continued to marvel at the aptness of the nun's questions and comments. In short order, she seemed to understand how strange my life was at the moment, even though I didn't reveal anything about the day skipping. She spoke again as we neared the door. I'm glad you found your way again. Keep doing what you know is right. I wondered at the emphasis in the nun's voice as she spoke that last sentence, but I felt encouraged by those words. The line moved ahead. When I looked behind, the nun no longer stood there. I saw her a short ways away, leaving the area. Well, that is odd. I also spotted the two likely police agents waiting in line a few people back. They avoided my gaze. When my turn came, I entered the hushed building, amazed at the quieting effect of the immense space. I found a seat and shifted into a posture of prayer. While I wished to be seen by the shadowing police agents, my prayers were not for show only. Kulabali waited. I watched the time on my phone advance to 4.59 and held my breath as I prepared to answer a question. I stood near the entryway to the stockroom of the Iperkeshi, looking at Amadi Kulabali. The other hostages stood or sat to the side. I looked at my phone to remind myself of Kulabali's text, Why are you not afraid to die? Two recent pieces of sensory information entered my mind. 
The first was an image of the carving on the front of Notre Dame Cathedral. The second were the words the nun had spoken, Few worthwhile things in life are easy. Keep doing what you know is right. I knew how to answer. I lifted my phone to show Kulabali that I intended to reply. I fingered, because on the last day it will be Jesus who judges me. He is the sinless one whose death makes sinners clean. I have trusted in him, and he will not reject me. No one else can give peace like that. The app translated the message, and I sent it. Kulibali's phone received. He read. No sound could be heard as everyone watched the unmoving terrorist. Without warning, Kulibali raised his gun and shot over my head. People screamed as bits of debris sprayed from the wall where the bullet struck. My heart beat furiously and my ears rang with the shot, but I didn't move. Is this it? I wondered, fairly certain the answer would be yes. Kulibali, for the moment, made no further move. His face seemed expressionless. In the next instant, his features twisted into rage and the gun lowered directly toward my heart. But, mercy upon mercy, Kulibali's phone rang. He hesitated, his arm stopped. He looked at his phone, then answered. He turned his back to me and the hostages. And in that moment, bold clarity filled me. He's becoming dangerous again. This has got to end, I thought as Kulibali spoke to the caller. On an impulse, I walked away, out into the main area of the store. I've got to keep him away from the others. Another thought, raise the shutters and unbar the door so the police can get in easier. I hurried to the front of the store, found the controls, and flipped the switch for the door bars and one of the front window shutters. A low mechanical noise sounded as those objects moved. I returned quickly to the stockroom. Kulabali turned and saw me as I entered. But he didn't look angry as I expected. He looked shaken. Le policier se sont déplacés pour attaquer mes amis, he reported woodenly. I guessed the Kawashi's time was fast running out. Kulabali retreated a ways toward a corner. I sat on the floor, leaning against the wall, but ready to act again. A short eternity of quiet but uneasy minutes passed before Kulabali became animated again and began to work his phone. He grunted as if satisfied and placed the phone to his ear. Once someone answered, he began a long, rapidly spoken, ten-minute speech. I could only understand bits. News, Kuwashi, Al-Qaeda, Yemen, police, stop. After a pause, Kulabali clearly and forcefully spoke words which made the other hostages gasp. Je vais tuer les otages si cette imprimerie est attaquée. I understood. Kulabali had called a news media outlet and was threatening to kill hostages if the Kuwashis were attacked. Again, an urgency came in. Get him away from the others. And so again, I walked out into the main part of the store. Kulabali saw me leave and commanded me to stop. I continued a few steps before sitting down in an aisle. Kulabali came out of the stockroom. I decided to press it with another message. If you want peace with God through Jesus, I can help you. God wanted us to meet. When Kulabali read the message, he looked incredulous and worried. He never expected any of this, and it's throwing him off. He feels God tugging at his heart. Kulabali sat at the end of the aisle, not far from me, where he could see movement in the stockroom. His head sank. I day-skipped.